the voting restriction bill um, eliminates in-person voting on Monday before Election Day, uh, eliminates uh, the use of not being able to use um, if you don't have ID to vote. Um, and I'm curious as to what evidence do you have that Ohio's election is somewhat rife with corruption, that these measures needed to be in place? Do you honestly think that Ohioans who are sitting at the dinner table are worried that the fact that I can't vote the day before election is some big issue in our state? You know, I think we do a very good job in conducting elections in Ohio. We count the ballots quickly. Uh, it's, it's, as they say, hard, hard to cheat, easy to vote. Uh, so, you know, I'm going to look at this bill. Uh, this bill has been changed a number of times. As you and I talk today, I'm not even sure exactly what's in it. I'm going to take a look at that and I'll make a decision. But uh, So you're undecided about whether well, to sign this? I always hesitate because I want to see the final version of the bill. Uh, frankly, the bill got a little better as it went forward, but I haven't seen the final, final version. But Ohio does a good job. You know, many times people say, well, isn't there cheating? Isn't this going to look? I don't know what happens in other states. What I do know is in the state of Ohio, we have developed a system that is a good system. Uh, when I was the attorney general, I was referred a few cases every year where there had been some cheating. Usually that is someone who voted in Florida and also voted in Ohio. And we have a few of those cases uh, every year, but not, not very many. And we do it right in Ohio. We do a very, very good job in the state of Ohio. I can't tell you what other states do. Ohio, we do a good job. So why do we need this? You don't seem to be overly convinced that there's a problem. Well, look, I think the burden is always on if someone wants to change the status quo, uh, you know, we have to, they have a burden of showing that there is a real need for this. So I'm going to look at the bill. I'm going to look at each, each separate provision that they have made and uh, ultimately make a decision. Of course, as governor, I'll either sign the bill or I'll veto the bill. Okay. Um, the Ohio House and Senate passed a tobacco bill that includes a measure preventing cities like Columbus from prohibiting the sale of flavored tobacco products such as menthol cigarettes and e-cigarettes. Does that make sense to you? Yes. Uh, here, here are the essential facts. Um, smoking in the state of Ohio cost the taxpayers. Uh, obviously, costs a lot of people their lives. It costs a lot of people a lot of, a lot of medical suffering but also cost the taxpayers hundreds and hundreds of million dollars every single year. The second thing we know uh, is that flavored tobacco uh, is a gateway for many young people. They start with a flavor. Uh, they, they get hooked on a very addictive drug, which is nicotine, but the way they do it is because that cigarette uh, has a taste to it uh, it has some sort of flavor. So eliminating the flavors uh, will save a, a, a lot of lives. But this bill would prohibit cities like Columbus from the sale of flavored tobacco. Yes, I think you have to look at the big issue. The big issue, uh, again, is you know, how do you save taxpayers' money? How do you save lives? And what Columbus did uh, certainly is consistent with saving lives and saving taxpayers a lot of money. The city of Columbus also wants to regulate um, guns. Um, they want to be able to address violent crime by eliminating um, certain guns that carry large magazines. The state is saying you can't do that. Why should you be stopping cities like Columbus from addressing violent crime, something that you yourself has said is a problem? Well, that, you know, that case is, is in court. The courts will ultimately uh, decide that. That is different from uh, the whole issue of flavored cigarettes and so now for the first time you know Columbus has just passed an ordinance and what the legislature did uh, in the bill that they passed last night was say no you Columbus you cannot do that now it's on my desk and, and I have to make a, a decision and I don't you know publicly say whether I'm going to veto or not veto something uh, until I've actually seen the bill and the bill gets to us and we take a look at all the provisions. Some of these bills are changed at the last moment. But um, it's very clear uh, that flavored cigarettes get a lot of young people addicted every single day and that costs the taxpayers a lot of money and a lot of people die 
uh, because they become addicted to, to tobacco, to smoking. But in terms of cities wanting to address violent crime by regulating guns, and specifically the number of magazines a certain gun could have, what the city of Columbus is trying to do, the state is fighting the city of Columbus on this. Why, should, why shouldn't cities be allowed to do this? You have a serious constitutional questions in regard to the Second Amendment. And the argument uh, saying that the city should not be able to do this has to do with the Second Amendment. So that is what is different than the whole issue of, of cigarettes. You don't believe home rule plays a role in that? Home rule is important. Uh, and what I have said in the past and what I'll say again today is that when the state wants to override home rule, the burden is upon those who want to override home rule to show why that is important. And you don't, you, I mean, this violent crime is something you've brought up that we need to do more to do this. This is a city saying, here's a solution. And the state's saying, no, you can't do that. People are wondering. Look, courts are going to decide that. And again, what is different about that is that we have a second amendment. And the Second Amendment is interpreted by the courts every day. And so this matter is now in the court. The court will tell us, the courts will tell us, ultimately, whether or not uh, you know, Columbus is right or whether the state of Ohio is right. We move on. You mentioned the courts, um, the abortion issue in Ohio. Do you envision supporting exceptions to the abortion law in Ohio? Majority of Ohioans believe that abortion should be legal. The way Ohio's law is right now, it's very restrictive. Do you see yourself supporting any exceptions to the abortion law? Here, here's what I've said. This matter we thought was going to be taken up by the, the General Assembly, by the legislature in the lame duck session. Obviously it was not. We would expect the legislature, the new legislature, to take this issue up uh, in, in, in January. Um, a couple things, and I say this as, as governor of all the people of the state of Ohio. Uh, as we go through this debate, it's important for us to remember that whatever side we are on, there are people on the other side of good faith, good people, and this is a, an issue that people feel very, very strongly about, and it's important for us to try to conduct this debate in, in a civil way where we show respect for our fellow Ohioans. Number two, I'm pro-life. Uh, I believe that it's important that we save as many lives a, as we can. Uh, what I've said to the General Assembly, uh, and again, I will say it again, is as we go about this, as they go about the job of writing a new law in regard to abortion, they need to keep in mind that it needs to be a law that will stay on the books. It needs to be a law that is sustainable. And by that I mean we are a state that allows people, the people of the state, to go to the ballot box and override what the legislature has done. And so as the legislature considers what to put in this abortion bill, it's very important. We try to save as many lives as we can, but at this, and at the same time, we have something that's sustainable and that does not get overridden when it goes on, on the ballot. So again, that balance has, has to be achieved, and I hope it can be achieved in a civil way where we don't tear the state apart uh, debating this, this issue. This is, we have other things that we need to focus on as well. This is very important. Uh, and again, we need to save as many lives as we can, but we also need to have something that's sustainable that will, be, uh, that will continue on. Redistricting was a huge issue this year. Um, I think you would admit that the system is somewhat broke. Um, in your next four years, what will you do to fix it? The system did not work. Uh, this was a new, uh, relatively new, two constitutional amendments. Uh, Democrats, Republicans came together to try to come up with a system that would make redistricting reapportionment work better. It didn't. Uh, we, it just did not work. We ended up in court. Uh, unfortunately, we ended up with a Supreme Court series of decisions uh, that, to some extent, flew in the face of what the objective was. The objective, one of the main objectives, was to have more compact districts. Uh, and at the same time have more competitive districts. Everyone, I think, believes that we should have more competitive districts rather than fewer competitive districts. Yet if you look at the Supreme Court decision, it compelled us uh, in, in, in some cases to have fewer, not more, competitive districts. No one envisioned that, but that's where we are today, and that's a problem.
It's a problem that how are you going to mm -hmm. fix? Look, I think the only thing, the only way we're really going to be able to permanently fix this is to go back, try to put a coalition of Democrats and Republicans together, and come up with a new constitutional amendment. I don't know any other way of doing it. The distracted driving bill passed, um, which would make it a primary offense. Do you think that bill went far enough to deter people from driving while distracted? I'm, I'm very, very happy uh, that finally, finally, uh, we have a distracted driving law uh, that after I sign it, in 90 days, it will go into effect. It will save lives. I've told our members of the General Assembly, uh, very few times are you going to be able to vote on something where a yes vote is clearly going to save lives in the future. We lose a lot of Ohioans, tragically, every single year who die uh, because of distracted driving. It gets it on the books. It moves the ball forward. We will save lives. We may want to look at this in a year or two. There may be some changes that we want to make in that law. But it's a strong signal to people in the state of Ohio we're taking distracted driving seriously. Uh, Alaska, Florida, Nevada, South Dakota, Tennessee, Texas, Washington, and Wyoming all have no income tax. Is it time Ohio moves towards no income tax? I would love to have no in income tax. I'd love to have no real estate tax. And uh, look, I, I don't see how uh, you move to no income tax at this point. Um, you know, the numbers don't work. Uh, if we're talking about, you know, funding our schools, giving parents more choice in regard to our schools, keeping up our state parks, uh, focusing on mental health, um, there's no way you could do that uh, by totally eliminating the income tax. And what the other thing that would happen is all other taxes would go up dramatically. You know, it's easy to say, let's do away with the income tax. But you're going you're gonna to see sales tax would have to go up dramatically, uh, would impact the poorest uh, of our citizens, citizens who, who, who need help the most. Uh, you would see real estate taxes go up. Again, they're high enough as it is. We're, I talk to senior citizens a lot who tell me they don't want to see their real estate taxes go up. So it's, it's nice to say we're going to do away with income tax until you look at what happens when you do it. And I don't think people want those consequences. Look, can we, can we reduce taxes? Yes, we've reduced taxes uh, under, under my watch. And the legislature has passed reductions. We can pass future reductions in, in, in income tax and other taxes. But to say we're going to totally do away with it uh, is just I don't see how that happens. Mm -hmm. You've halted all executions in the state until the Department of Corrections develops a new court-approved execution protocol. Does the death penalty have a future in Ohio? I don't think you're going to, there's been no executions uh, since I became governor. I don't anticipate we will see any uh, executions as long as I'm governor of the state. Um, look, we are in a situation where the only way executions can legally take place is through lethal injection. And yet, we have drug companies where we would get these drugs or we would get their drugs somewhere who have threatened the state, threatened the people of Ohio, and said, if you use our drug in execution, you're not going to be able to buy our drugs that save lives. Uh, state hospitals are not going to be able to get these drugs that we essentially need. So we're, we're in a situation, uh, unless the law has changed, where we're not going to see executions going forward. Last time we spoke, um, we were talking about the encouragement of people to get their booster shots. We're now a year into it. Oh, you can get some of the water. That's all right. Okay. Um, so we've now we've got COVID, we've got measles, we've got flu. What are you hearing from the Ohio Department of Health? How concerned are you about the colliding of all of these together and the fact that we've got unvaccinated children spreading measles in our state and we are at the epicenter of the measles epidemic? We do have uh, measles outbreaks. Measles can be very, very dangerous, uh, and so that certainly does does concern me. Uh, you know, Dr. Vanderhoff, who's our director of health, uh, you know, tells me, and other doctors tell me that we're seeing the flu season about two months earlier than we normally see it. So you've got a lot of things. You've got the COVID still out there. Uh, you, you've got measles. You've got young children with other respiratory uh, problems. So it's something that parents need to be very, very much aware of. Uh, and any you know, adult who has not been vaccinated, for example, and 
needs to be concerned about it as as, as well. So, uh, you know, it's it's we are concerned about this, and I think what the state has to continue to do, the health department has to continue to do, and local doctors do, is to let people know the facts. Continue to advise people. Here's what's going on. Here where the dangers are. Uh, now, the good news is that with immunization for children, we are not seeing really a downtick in that. Uh, we're seeing immunization about where it's been. We've been able to maintain that, and that certainly is a good thing. There's a bill before the House that would ban mandates of COVID-19 vaccines at colleges and universities in Ohio. Was that something you'd sign? Well, we don't know what the final bill would be. Um, you know, we're, what we're not, we're not seeing today, uh, educators, uh, you know, penalizing children uh, or students uh, for not being vaccinated. We're not, as far as COVID, we are, we are not seeing that. We're well on our way through this COVID. It's still out there very, very much. So look, I've got to see what's, what else is in that bill. Uh, what the legislature was doing last night was talking about putting it into, into another bill, and then they talked about putting in another bill. So, you know, ultimately, uh, it depends on what's in the bill what the language is. I'm a person who thinks that, you know, you got to wait until you see what the final language is. The uh, Ohio State Buckeyes are playing the Georgia Bulldogs in the college football semifinal. Do you have a score for us? I don't have a score, but uh, I, I, I intend to be there, and I'm taking some of our grandkids and, and kids down, and uh, we're looking for an upset. And I think, look, I think this Ohio State team on any given day or any given night can beat any, any uh, team in the country. Do you have a wager with the governor of, of Georgia? We're, we're going to have a wager, I hope. Uh, so we don't have, we don't have a wager yet. Uh, I, I, of course, had to pay off our a wager uh, to Michigan, uh, Governor, Governor Gretchen Whit Whitmer. And, uh, you know, so I, I wrote her a note as I, you know, uh, paid off the, paid off the, the, the debt or the bet. Um, you know, when you, when you look at your, your next four years, um, you'll be term limited. This will be it for you for, to run for governor. I'm wondering now, do you govern differently? Because now you don't have to necessarily uh, gain the trust or, or have to go along with everything the legislature does. You don't have to look for votes anymore. Are Ohioans going to see a different governor this next four years in terms of the way you govern? Well, will you stand up to your party? Look, the, the people of the state of Ohio have given me the most precious thing there is, and that's time. Uh, time to finish our business, our unfinished business. And we're going to really focus on three things. We're going to focus, uh, and this is in no particular order, we're going to focus on jobs. Uh, Jim Rhodes, you know, once, once said that jobs solve a lot of social problems. Maybe not all social problems, but they solve a lot. Jobs are very important. We are creating jobs at a very fast rate in the state of Ohio, and we're going to continue to do that. Uh, number two is education. Uh, from reaching out to a pregnant mother who's having difficulties and helping her all the way to getting, having a 60-year-old who is still working and making sure that his or her skill sets are where they need to be so that they can continue to be productive, we're going to focus on education because that's how we give everybody an opportunity to live their American dream. The third thing is mental health. Uh, we have neglected mental health as a country. Uh, John Kennedy, uh, when he was president, the last major bill he signed was the Community Mental Health Act. In that, we made a pledge that we would deinstitutionalize our hospitals, but at the same time, we would build a system where every Ohioan had the chance to get, and every American had the chance to get mental health. We've not done that. We are moving in that right direction, and we're going to have, continue to have a real sense of urgency in that area. You bring up mental health. Parity law in the state is a huge issue. You have health providers who are providing mental health to children who aren't getting reimbursed at the rate that they need to to keep the lights on. Are you going to go after insurance companies to pressure them to uphold the parity law? We're going to do everything we can to enforce the parity law in the state of Ohio. Uh, the way it works is the majority of these policies do not come under the jurisdiction of the state of Ohio. But in those cases where they do, we're going to continue to do everything that, that we can. Uh, we have to change uh, everyone's perspective in regard to mental health. We have to look at someone who has a mental health problem 
uh, just like we would look at that person if they had uh, cancer or if they had some other medical problem. It is a medical problem. So changing the stigma uh, that surrounds mental health is a big part of what, what we have to do. And I think we've started. We had a campaign, you may have, may have seen it on TV, um, it, you know, beat the stigma. And part of that is to get people to understand if you have a mental health problem, it's just like another medical problem and we have to treat you that way. Isn't the real challenge though also incentivizing people to stay in the profession and to join in the profession because yes. we have more people in need than we do people that can actually help them. They're getting out of the business. Last night the legislature passed a bill uh, that I'd requested to provide $85 million to help with the workforce problem that we have with not enough people working in the mental health field. Uh, and so I'm very happy with what they did and that is a, going to be a movement forward. What we're going to do is many people in this area who are going to college, they have to have internships, apprenticeships where they don't get paid at all. And what happens is that is a barrier for many of them and they can't go on. So we're going to remove that barrier and we believe create a lot more uh, people who are able to, to get their degree and help in the area of mental health. So they'll be paid now, those pay, will be yes, paid. They'll be paid, they'll be paid and that will remove a barrier and people in the field tell us that that will mean that there will be a lot more people who will be able to get in the field, a lot more people who will be able to complete their, their degree and go out in, into the workforce. What do you think your single most important mission will be in the next four years for Ohioans? I think we continue to focus on jobs, we continue to focus on education and mental health. These are the things that we need. Our goal is for every Ohioan to be able to live up to their God-given potential. And by focusing on education, by focusing on bringing more jobs in, giving more young people different opportunities, whether that, that be in the, in the technical field, whether that be going to college, giving them more broad opportunities, and at the same time removing the barrier that exists because people have a mental health problem, uh, that's how we move Ohio forward. Will you play a role in the selection of the new president of Ohio State and what do you want to yeah. see in that next leader? It's not the job of the governor to select the president of Ohio State or any other state university, but I've told the members uh, of the Board of Trustees of Ohio State that their most important job, the most important job of any board of trustees is to select the president of the university and being president of the university of the Ohio State University is a very very important job so uh, they need to all be engaged I want every member of the board to be directly involved in the selection of the next president of Ohio State what kind of leadership qualities do you want to see in that person I want someone uh, who understands our state I want someone uh, who it's along well with people, uh, someone who is a visionary uh, and looks to the future of where Ohio, not just Ohio State, but where Ohio uh, needs to go. I had a very close, uh, continue to have a close, uh, good working relationship with Dr. Johnson. Uh, I think she has the vision and she'll still be present for you know a, a few more months. But having a vision of where the state needs to go, where the university needs to go, we expect a president to have that vision, and that's certainly something that uh, the next president of Ohio State needs to have. Could it be someone outside academia? Look, uh, it, ab it absolutely could be someone uh, outside that. Uh, we're just seeing now, for example, uh, Jim Tressel, uh, who just uh, indicated he's going to leave his job after a decade at Youngstown State University. There were people, I'm sure, who said, oh, no, he, you know, he doesn't have a Ph.D. or he doesn't have uh, the background. But you talk to the people in Youngstown, uh, the Mahoning Valley, uh, and almost to a person, they're going to tell you that the best thing that's ever happened to Youngstown State University is to have Jim Tressel uh, at the helm. Okay. Anything else you'd like to add, Governor? Any uh, New Year's resolution for the state of Ohio? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Happy New Year to everyone. All right.